Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for inviting me today. Um, and uh, what I'd like to do in the next half an hour or so is talk to you about a few, I won't call them difficulties, but you'll see that they're kind of difficulties, um, but issues I've had with trying to take psychology generally uh, to, to the public and the average person. Um, if, you, if you're a psychologist, you're always very enthusiastic about your discipline. You're very keen um, to, to explain to people that psychology has ways of, scientific ways of explaining behavior, explaining who you are and why you are who you are, and also giving you um, tips and, and real ways to, to change things and uh, solutions to problems. So we're quite enthusiastic about those things. And, and what I'd like to do um, today is talk to you about some of the problems I've had in getting those issues over to, um, to the, the, the average person. Um, you'll see that some of these uh, are quite difficult issues. Um, you, you can take a message to someone and they can read it, uh, they can see it, they can watch it in a video, but then they, they simply go, don't believe that, um, and then that's it. Uh, so where do you go from that point? So I'll address some of those issues as well. Um, but first of all, I'd like to um, talk about some issues that I've had with writing a blog. I mean, it's a lovely way of actually trying to talk to people about your, your discipline and try and get over messages about your discipline and so on. So writing a blog is quite uh, important in that respect. Um, and I've, I have a regular blog now with Psychology Today, so I often write about mainly mental health issues uh, and trying to get over explanations and solutions for mental health problems in, a, in an everyday accessible way for anyone who wants to read it. So I want to talk to you about, first of all, about a couple of the problems I've had with a couple of my blogs. Um, one blog was five traits that could get you abducted by aliens. Um, and I'm talk about that in a moment. And the second one is spirit possession and mental health. Those are the two titles. Um, now, five traits that could get you abducted by aliens. Pe most people don't know that there are traits that could get you abducted by aliens. Um, and it was my attempt to explain alien abduction experiences with psychological science. Uh, there's a good friend of mine um, called Richard McNally, who's a professor of clinical psychology at Harvard University. And he spent 10 to 15 years studying people who claim to have been abducted by aliens and comparing them with people who hadn't claimed to have been abducted by aliens. So what, what were, the, were there any psychological differences between those people? Anyway, he came up with a, a number of traits, and this was my five traits. Here's four of them. He found that people who claimed to be abducted by aliens mainly had um, sleep paralysis problems. Uh, at waking, they would often have hallucination-like experiences uh, and, and those kinds of things. They were, they were more prone to sleep paralysis. In memory experiments, they were also prone to false memories. Um, they uh, would often come up with words in a word test that weren't in the word a test and, and, and really claim that they were there. So they, they, were, um, they were prone to false memories. Um, so, uh, new Age beliefs, uh, they often had ways of explaining things which were not necessarily scientific, but alternative ways of explaining things, and that was their preference. And then they, they were fantasy prone. They, they would uh, uh, be very prone um, to daydreaming about things and so on. And I thought this was a beautiful piece of research over 10 years. Uh, and for me, it was a lovely piece of experimental psychopathology where you look at the kinds of traits that might lead people to believe that they've been abducted by aliens. Um, now, they may have been abducted by aliens. Uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I don't know all the evidence. But that particular blog uh, has had, to date, over 400,000 views, right? And there's 108 comments on it. OK, so what kinds of comments did I get? Did I get, uh, thank you, Professor Davey, for explaining this to us. Uh, that's really helpful. Not really. No, I didn't. I'll give you an example of some of the comments I've had. 
Um, uh, and basically, have I convinced anyone that psychology has the explanation of this? If you look at the comments, hardly any of the people claim that I've explained it for them. And you get things like this. Uh, this is a comment, totally something article. Can't believe somebody would write a piece as obnoxious as that in psychology today. Agree, what a damn obnoxious piece. Like, how does this guy have the gall to disagree with your specific view? Uh, then we get the conspiracy theorists. Uh, secrets are carefully guarded, and even though the government has proof and knowledge of ETs, the current policy is not to disclose that information to the public, at least not yet. So we wait. Um, and then, this is, I regularly get this. When I, when I try to put over a, a psychological explanation for something um, that maybe treads a little bit on people's beliefs, they still believe, uh, for example, that someone was abducted by aliens, but can I recommend a therapist? Uh, that kind of thing. Um, so the other, the other blog, or similar kind of blog, was, was spirit possession and mental health. Um, spirit possession in many cultures and for many religions is a way of explaining mental health problems um, uh, because uh, you get reports of spirit possession related to trauma exposure, specifically, for example, in many, in many cultures. And um, that's why I've got this photograph of a, um, a child's soldier uh, who's, that these people are often abducted from villages and family and made to fight, which is a very traumatic experience for a, for a child. And they then appear to be possessed, uh, if you like, in, in the sense that what it is, it's a way of explaining psychotic episodes and dissociative sem symptoms. Dissociative symptoms as a result of trauma are often uh, look as though somebody's personality has changed, that they've, if you've like, been taken over by another spirit. Well, that, that particular blog had 166,000 views, um, and also a load of comments. Um, uh, if the truth were known, I'd say it's the other way around. Sometimes mental trauma is modern culture's way of explaining spiritual possession, for example. So people are very happy to turn it on, the, on its head and say, no, you're wrong, I'm right, for example. No matter how much you might use evidence-based science to try and explain these things, um, they're not willing to accept it. Uh, sorry to break it to Graham Davy, but a human being is an integrated body, soul, and spirit, and not just body and mind. There is a dimension behind the mind called spirit, and there is a spiritual world as well as a material world. Okay, fine. Uh, they didn't provide any uh, objective scientific evidence for that, but uh, it's their view. Um, and here's a good one. In ignorance of the subject is the culprit. In 2018, psychiatrists from hospitals in the UK recognised that a substantial number of patients hospitalised and previously diagnosed with mental illness are in reality possessed by entities. Um, uh, I haven't found the reference for that. Um, I suspect it's a little bit of fake news. Uh, um, I, I, don't, I, I did not hear of that, um, and nor have I found any evidence for it um, either. But uh, again, it's the same kind of theme running through this as I got with the, with the alien abductees blog. Uh, people are not willing to listen to alternative views. Um, so what does it tell us about scientific, uh, that response? What do the res those responses tell us about uh, what, what we're trying to say? Well, the first one is the obvious one. Uh, I've, I've chosen two kind of extreme examples where people who, uh, are if, who claim to be alien abductees and people who believe in spirit possession, they have very, very uh, uh, ingrained beliefs about <coughs> those things. Uh, and many people um, have deeply held beliefs uh, that they're about their experiences, and those beliefs actually give people meaning in their lives. Alien abductees will very often, uh, that will change their life for them. It's going to be something uh, that, that affects the rest of their life and gives meaning to their life. So you can't just take those things away, because if that is what makes a person, you can't just take it away, because then there is no person. Um, so we have to find ways, if you like, if we want to continue pursuing a scientific explanation we have to try with people. We have to try and find another way. 
And the second thing is scientific explanations alone do not convince people. Everyone who's, who's a scientist or a social scientist or a biological scientist, um, they believe that science is the bee's knees and that science is the only way to do things. Um, now, there are many people who just simply are not going to believe that. They have alternative ways of understanding the world uh, to science and they just won't accept scientific explanations. And as psychologists, we, we often just assume that because we're putting an argument in a scientific way, that, uh, that actually people will just believe it and change their minds. Uh, that, that isn't the case. Um, and th that's the third point. It, um, it's insufficient just uh, to provide, providing an alternative explanation is insufficient to, to change their views. Uh, it's going to take a little bit more than that. Um, and they will very much argue their own point uh, in, in the ways that they can. I think the third thing is, uh, and we, I'll come across this again uh, a bit later in, in the talk, is that what your average person wants is not explanations. They want solutions. They want solutions to problems uh, that they have. Um, and you're always going to have difficulty with uh, with explanations, because there are many, many different ways of explaining different things. Um, but if you can give someone a solution to a particular pressing problem that they have, then they're going to start believing uh, in, the, in, the, in the discipline that you're trying to get over to them. So taking psychology to the people. Well, um, as David has mentioned, the BPS uh, has a duty to raise public awareness of psychology and increase the influence of psychological practice. That's in the, in, in the society's charter. So uh, as a society, we have to do it. And I think as individual psychologists, it's something we want to do. Um, uh, for example, um, psychology is one, still one of the most popular undergraduate uh, disciplines at university, at higher education. And th those are people who want to study psychology. Uh, as well. So um, hopefully we have something to say. Um, if you're taking psychology to the people, the, the first thing you ask is, are they going to understand what the word psychology means? Is, is it a household word? Well, it probably is a household word, but for different households, it's going to mean very, very different things. Um, and one of the ones we will come across is basically um, psychology is the place where you send somebody when they're a bit crazy. That's it, full stop. Um, uh, so we've got to go, if you like, a bit beyond that in trying to explain uh, what psychology is. Um, does the average person know what psychology has to offer? No, I'm almost certainly not. Um, it, uh, the average person probably is not aware of almost most things that psychologists are interested in. I mean, in a kind of broad sphere, um, as psychologists, we're interested in explaining behavior. Uh, we're interested in uh, uh, finding practical solutions for uh, people's problems. Uh, and the reason for that is that psychology as a science um, and as a discipline is all about understanding behavior and understanding thought, and if we understand the processes that lead to people behaving in certain ways, and if we understand how people think, uh, then we can put some, uh, some processes or programs in there for change. Uh, and I'll come across those particular things again in a moment. Um, but again, we keep coming back to this, and I keep coming back to this. Um, people are only going to get to take notice of psychology uh, if it addresses their most pressing problems. Because uh, life's a difficult thing for, for many, many people. Life is, uh, life is, is, is full of problems. Um, and what psychology almost certainly needs to do is to address people through those problems and say, look, um, we have some solutions here. We have some attempts at solutions that you might want to try. Um, here you are, have a go at that. And then you might be able to convert people to a, a more scientific view of themselves and the world than you might have done before. So how could we do it? Well, how do we get to people? Well, uh, traditional way, here we are. This is a public lecture. Uh, but as best, you only get through to about 
uh, a few hundred people uh, at best with, with public lectures, not many. Um, when I was uh, chair of the, uh, what was then the Publications and Communications Board in, in, the, in the BPS, Every year we had a fund, uh, I think it was about £15,000, £20,000, a fund for taking psychology to the people. So people would um, submit various, uh, various projects and you know, we'd look at them and then allocate money uh, to those projects. Now, when I was on that board, it started off being the case that almost everyone submitted uh, funds <coughs> for conferences and set one-day seminars and things like that, usually of the kind a bit like this, where you've got maybe uh, 50 to 100 people. Um, and in the end, we, we decided we didn't quite feel that that was probably the best way to do it, because what we need to do is use that money in a sustainable way. So it's not just a one-off event, then it's gone, and all that's left of that event is in the heads and the minds and the memories of the people that were there. Um, a much better way is to use st uh, sustainable um, projects like websites, uh, DVDs, um, videos that can be passed on through different people and people can access generally. Um, there are a number of questions we have to ask ourselves uh, here as well. How do we define the audience that, that we're trying to reach? Um, I must admit, you know, I, I've just written my first pop science book on psychology. And I only asked myself this question after I'd written it, which is a bit daft. Um, but I thought I was writing it for the educated layperson, if you like. Um, now, uh, maybe that's kind of not good enough. The book's about anxiety. What I should have done, really, is address it to people who suffer anxiety. Um, not just to the average layperson, because it, it's a little bit meaningless in, in, in those cases. But again, I'll, I'll come back to that point in a moment. Um, another thing, and, and these two things go together, we're not going to make people interested in what psychology is uh, as a science, and we're not even going to make them terribly interested in the solutions we have to offer unless uh, people who make in important decisions about our well-being and public needs uh, are also convinced about these things. So we need to actually look at policy makers and we need to convince them uh, of, of um, uh, what good things psychology has to offer. Because uh, unless, unless you have the resources to provide these solutions, they're not going to happen. Um, unless they're just simple one-off self-help, guided self-help uh, uh, lessons, those kinds of things. So what does psychology have to offer? Well, evidence-based explanations of behavior, experience, and events, I've already, I've already mentioned that. Um, it has solutions to pressing problems. And what are these pressing problems? Well, um, they are social issues. They're terrorism, health care provision, these are just examples. Poverty, discrimination, crime and violence. Psychology has um, uh, things to offer on all of those issues because all of anything that uh, is um, a result of people's behavior is then something that psychology will have something to offer on. Uh, and again, I think the society has uh, uh, um, offered um, advice and information on a lot of those, those particular issues. But perhaps more individually, um, the average person, daily stresses, relationships, parenting, self-esteem, working conditions, financial problems, bullying, all of these things are, are, are the kind of things that affect the individual. Uh, and again, we can help people uh, with those kinds of individual problems. And I, this, this is something interesting that I came across while I was just writing this particular talk. And uh, it goes back to, the, uh, to 2007. Ronald Levant was uh, 
the president of the American Psychological Association in 2007. And, and he wanted to spend his presidential year uh, taking psychology to the people. That was his, going to be his main aim in that particular year. Um, I don't know how well he did. Uh, I, I haven't looked at that. But one of the things he came up with was um, promoting coping and wellness, a psychological checkup. Now, we're kind of all very happy to go for physical health checkups uh, on a regular basis. Why don't we have um, psychological checkups on a regular basis? Um, uh, especially since mental health problems are, are high profile at the moment as well. And one day, let's hope, we, we will be able to do that, where you can go to a psychological practitioner, let's say every year, uh, you can discuss your problems, and that person can give you some advice on coping, uh, wellness, and so on. Um, but again, that's not ever going to happen unless you convince policymakers to resource it. Uh, um, and that's, again, the, the dual edge with these kinds of things is that you can go to the individual person, but you also have to make sure that you're also convincing policymakers uh, about your, your ideas as well. Again, which, I'm, you know, I'm not saying the society doesn't do this. It's always tried to do these things. Um, but we have to do them in tandem, um, almost probably. So how do we do it? Well, um, how can we try and get um, to, to the individual? Well, blogs and podcasts uh, uh, and provide solutions for solution seekers. The thing about blogs and podcasts is they're out there, and if people are seeking them uh, or Googling them, they will find it. Uh, you, you can bet your life they'll find it at some point. Um, so that, that's probably a pretty good way of getting people to uh, to 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 actually see your message. You still haven't convinced them that, uh, what your message, that your message has any relevance to them, um, but they'll see your message. Um, there's the media. Um, for example, psychologists on TV, uh, psychologists are becoming more uh, influential as commentators on, on uh, um, things psychological, obviously. Um, there was a lot of scepticism. I remember, uh, I don't know how long it's been going, but uh, all of you will be familiar with uh, the TV program. Was it Big Brother? Yeah, everybody knows what that is. Uh, uh, and, and this was many, many years ago. And there used to be a psychologist who would comment on the behavior of people in, in the Big Brother house. Um, all other psychologists at that time were horrified that a psychologist was on Big Brother uh, talking about uh, the behavior and trying to explain the behaviors of, of these people in, 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 in the house. Um, there was good reason for that at the time because uh, it, it's, no good, uh, it's no good just talking at a low level or a trivial level about people's behavior unless you're getting over some genuine information that are going to interest people and influence people. Um, and very often that didn't happen uh, in, in, in these kinds of, um, in these kinds of uh, commentaries. Um, and often it looked just like common sense logic that anybody could have said about uh, someone's behavior. Now, a lot of psychology is common sense. Uh, let, let's be clear about that. A lot of psychology is common sense. Um, but a lot of people don't apply common sense. Uh, they might know it, and they might feel, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm someone who's very uh, sensible, but then not apply it. And, and again, that's where psychology comes in. If, if, if it is common sense, then why don't you apply it generally? That kind of thing. So uh, that is different nowadays. I think uh, we, we have a couple of TV psychologists and radio psychologists here today. And of course, they're very, very good at what they do. And of course, um, um, I'm not just saying that, but they are very, very good at what they do. Um, we've got popular publishing as well. Um, again, when I was chair of the Publication Communications Board, um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the top Sante magazine. It's, I think it's still a women's health and well-being magazine, uh, generally. Um, but uh, the, the society 
uh, had um, basically had a, a partnership with Top Santo, where psychologists would write uh, articles about health and well-being, which would go into that magazine every month. Um, this looked like a great idea because we were getting over science-based facts and uh, 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 basically about uh, what was good for people and so on. Um, I don't know if it's still going, <laughs> uh, to be honest. I tried to check. I suspect it's not um, for, for whatever reasons. You know, uh, these things end not because they're failures but for other reasons as well. Um, so, but it seemed a good idea at the time. Um, Again, you have to ask the question, well, how many people are we getting to? How many people are we getting the message to there? Can we do it in a broader way? There's popular science and self-help publications. Um, uh, popular science books are often very helpful for the educated layperson to learn a little bit about what psychology is about. And there are self-help publications as well. Now, again, I, I'm taking a guess here, but my opinion is basically that my view of it is that for every popular science book about psychology they're probably verging on a thousand self-help books uh, for example um, popular science is about explaining something self-help publications are about helping people with a specific problem and very often uh, those self-help uh, publications don't bother about how you acquired the problem that you had. They're there to give you tips and advice about what you should do now to, for example, to uh, manage your anxiety or manage your depression and so on, uh, those kinds of things. Um, so again, that, that's a very good example of where people aren't interested in explanations. They don't care where it came from. Um, they just want a, a solution here and now for it. And finally, uh, we have to target policymakers. Um, uh, and it, whatever we do, especially if we're offering solutions for things, we will have to have resources um, that will enable us to roll out the, that particular advice generally. So we've always got to be um, talking to policymakers and, and persuading policymakers that uh, what we've got to offer is useful. Okay, uh, talk about some, um, uh, talk about, talk about my book, okay, uh, uh, that's the cover, um, it's getting near Christmas and I can assure everyone that it's actually a very good present for uh, family members of all ages and friends. Um, but it, it's the first time I've had a go at, at writing, let's say, a, a popular science book and it's it's basically about um, where anxiety comes from you know the, the, the psychological process processes that give rise to people feeling feeling different or experiencing different forms of anxiety um, so in that sense I'm I'm, I'm, I'm providing explanations here uh, and some tips there are chapters I, you can't write a book like that without giving people tips about how they can uh, manage their various anxiety symptoms for example but it's largely all about um, it, it's all it's all about explaining where it comes from and and for me that's that's a big thing because I think that if you can understand where things that you, you you're, you're not clear about like an anxiety problem like a, a panic attacks for example things like that what made that happen uh, if you can understand the psychology behind that then uh, for me, when I've had those similar kinds of problems, uh, basically understanding where it comes from is three quarters of the way to finding a solution for it uh, and changes the way that you view your symptoms a lot. So I, I always thought that, that explanations are, um, uh, are, are important, but most people won't have time to absorb lengthy explanations, for example, or just simply won't be interested in explanations. They just say, give me a solution for this. So this book, um, I, I targeted the educated layperson because I was told by the publisher that that's who I should be writing it for. And publishers don't publish anything unless you do absolutely everything that they tell you to do. Um, otherwise, it's not, it's not getting done. But again, um, 
I, I was writing it as if I was actually writing it for people who didn't have anxiety, which is kind of odd in retrospect. Um, and I would have written it a little bit differently uh, if, if, it, if, if I were doing it that way. And can explanations promote solutions? Well, uh, so far in this talk, I've talked about explanations and solutions as though they're different things. But no, they're very much related. Explanations uh, themselves provide solutions. They do. Um, and the basic, but the basic problem is most people just don't have time for the explanation. They want the solution. Uh, and they want it quick. Um, Publishers say, OK, if we all publish this book, if you tell us what's new in what you offer. Um, uh, every, every pop science book has to have something <coughs> novel in it. that There's a message, a new message, a novel message. So if you're thinking of writing one, um, think about what your novel message is, your, your, your new message is going to be. In this one, I was just uh, basically, uh, there's an anxiety epidemic. Um, uh, interesting, if you look at all the figures, uh, and, and the facts, um, there's not really, or well, there hasn't really been an increase in mental health problems over the last 30 years, generally. What has happened is that people are now more readily accessing services for mental health problems <coughs> when before they wouldn't do that. But the one, uh, the one case in which we have seen a change, uh, an upward change, in uh, prevalence of an, uh, a mental health problem is anxiety. There are clear studies out there which show that it is increasing. Um, it just so happens that one of my, my um, areas of research is, is pathological worrying. And uh, basically, I've got 20 years worth of student data on their levels of worrying. And I was astounded recently when I looked back at, at those scores it goes up steadily over 20 years, and their worry scores have gone up by 20% in 20 years. And it's not just my university actually making uh, students very, very anxious. I've got the same data from other universities, and it's exactly the same. Um, so anxiety, th there, th there's real scientific um, evidence that anxiety problems are, are increasing generally. Make it personal. Well. Um, uh, that was easy for me to do. I've, I, in, in the past, suffered uh, a number of, of, of anxiety-based uh, conditions, which gave me a lot of insight into the research I was doing. I, I, it was great for me. I, I felt very privileged to be able to do research on, on, on anxiety generally, because um, I could see what the problems were. So I did make it personal. Um, you know, the reader is happy then to kind of empathise a little bit with you, gets to know you, gets to know your problems, and says, oh, they're the same as my problems. I didn't, I didn't really know that. That's good, and so on. Um, and it's a, it's a very trendy thing to do, not just in psychology at the moment, where the author says, well, I've suffered that, you know, or I've done that, um, and here's, here's uh, how it is. And you have to tell a story, amuse the reader, um, a lot of the time in, in a book like this. Uh, you need to um, you need to tell a story that is you know you can't just describe a scientific study it's boring basically you have to put it into a story and make it a little bit amusing maybe um, as well and then uh, at the end provide practical tips and solutions so that's basically uh, a little bit about how I came to that book and uh, in, in, in my attempt to actually get some information over to, 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 to the public about anxiety. Just a couple more slides very quickly. Um, what does psychology need to do, sending the message? Well, we said early, what, what does psychology mean for, uh, for people? We, maybe, we, maybe we need to do a little bit more about that basic kind of thing as well. Um, for most people, psychology, psychologists are people that you go and see uh, when someone is, is mentally unwell, for example. Uh, and it's, it, it, they don't get the bigger picture of what we're doing. Do we need to rebrand psychology? I, I mean, I, I've got an anecdote here. Uh, when I first went to university, which was uh, um, quite a few years ago now, uh, we didn't have things like mobile phones. My parents didn't even have a phone uh, in, in the house. So 
uh, I agreed with my, my dad that we would write to each other each, each week. Um, after 10 weeks of the first term, I'd written 10 letters. He'd, I'd received none from him. So I got back, I said, I wrote to you every week. He said, yeah. He said, I wrote back to you every week. And I said, well, what, what were you doing? Um, I said, well, I'm doing psychology at, at Bangor. I told you that. Uh, and he had been sending uh, his letters to uh, the Department of Physiology in Bognor. Um, <laughs> and fair enough, you know, uh, he, he, he was a factory worker. Um, he didn't know anything about uh, the educated world. Um, he couldn't even spell psychology. So maybe we need uh, to rebrand psychology. Uh, it, it's a very long and difficult word to spell. Uh, offers, offers solutions to personal problems. Again, uh, we, I've covered that quite a bit. Um, we have to also target uh, uh, policymakers. Again, that's pretty important, I think, uh, in the same way if we're going to get stuff over to people. Um, and the last point, um, in 2017, almost 75,000 students enrolled for a first degree in psychology. That figure is roughly what it's been uh, for many years. That We always thought that the bubble was going to burst, the psychology bubble was going to burst. Psychology is the third most uh, popular uh, subject at A-level now. Um, lots of people are interested in it. Now, wouldn't it be nice if every undergraduate psychology degree had a module in taking psychology to the people. And they could do projects in doing that. There's 75,000 of them. Uh, that's, if you like, our ambassadors and our emissaries that are going to get some of this information to people. And I'll end on that note. Thank you.